Friends, welcome back to the Ransom Tar Podcast. John and Stacy Eldridge this week. This is episode three in a four-part series we're doing around the practices in Get Your Life Back, Everyday Practices for a World Gone Mad. And the book is out officially Tuesday, February 11th. The book hits the streets and Oh, gosh, just so excited for you because I know what this is going to do for you. Trying to help people recover heart and soul, recover humanity in this crazy, crazy world. Things have just gotten so complicated, and most people's souls, whether they know it or not, are literally besieged. Mm. They are under siege. Mm -hmm. And there's the madness of the world and the pace of life and the inundation of content. And then there's the darkness of the hour and the war that we find ourselves in, in the unseen realm, which is ramping up. So this is an intense time to be a human being. I've been saying it's a brutal time to be a human being. And wholeheartedness is not an option. And so in episode one, Alan and I talked about simple unplugging and how what we're experiencing right now in the world is literally an assault on our attention. Our attention is kind of the last bit of unclaimed real estate. And everybody is vying for your attention through, you know, clickbaits and pop-ups and notifications and all the little pings and chimes and vibrations and all that. And it's not just technology. It's, it's at the gas station and it's in the airport and as you go through the mall and everywhere you go, something's trying to grab your attention. So we talked about being kind to our souls and in simple unplugging in episode one. And then in episode two, we had Sue on our team in and Sue was talking about kindness. That was the chapter she chose. And looking at the pace of life, for example, that we expect of ourselves, mm. and is it kind? And looking at some of the choices that we are making that actually are within our realm to make some choices about how much media we're consuming, what we do with our evenings, looking at kindness as a way of healing and nourishing the soul. And then today, my wife, Stacy, and I. And Stace, what chapter did you pick? Ooh, it was hard to pick one, by the way. But what I picked was the chapter on benevolent detachment. I love that chapter. I love that chapter, too. And it has been and is continuing to be profoundly not only helpful to me, but life-changing, truly. Why? Oh, my goodness. Because I am not even aware of how much I am carrying on any given day, on every given day. And benevolent detachment is the practice of, of letting things go, of giving them to Jesus, the one who is able to carry. I care, but I'm not meant to carry. And so when I practice benevolent detachment, which I know we're going to really talk into, I can literally feel the weights that I'm not meant to carry fall off my shoulders, mm. and my heart mm. rises. My heart rises, and Doesn't it's it? oh my goodness! And it's just that I'm able then to live and love the way I meant to, versus being crushed by weights that I'm actually not meant to carry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gang. So let me explain it. Yeah, and, good. And then we can unpack it. It's an idea that I got from the Desert Fathers, and I don't know who coined the phrase, but the idea that the human soul was never meant to carry the burdens of the world. Benevolent detachment. Benevolent, because I'm not talking about something that's done in anger. I'm not talking about cynicism. I'm not talking about, you know, checking out. Right. It's not unkind. Right. It's not a defiant or resentful or even overwhelmed, checking out, benevolence, something done in love, detachment, because we are invited in Scripture to let it go, to give it all to God, to begin to learn a way of soulful care and soulful practice where in love and in kindness, we can peel apart the Velcro. Yes. 
by which the world or people or a crisis has attached itself right, to us. Right, right. It's actually about aligning ourselves with the way we are meant to work in union with God. Yeah, right. And so let me let me give you a little bit of the, the biblical background of this so you kind of see how richly this, this actually is described in Scripture because— When I put benevolent detachment in front of people, and we've been speaking about it in some different places recently, including in an environment that was fairly unfamiliar with us, Mm -hmm. you know, don't really know John and Stacey very well, don't know uh, Ransomed Heart, and I was trying to describe benevolent detachment, and you could just see almost the suspicion of like, really? That doesn't, no, you just sound like a counselor. That doesn't sound like that's from Scripture, so— Let's start with the story in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 1, beginning in verse 29, because Jesus' ability to detach is just extraordinary. And you know that you're watching love. Mm -hmm. Anytime you watch Jesus, you're watching love, and you're watching mature love. Like, if you want to learn to love maturely, watch yes. Jesus. Okay, so here we go. Chapter 1 to Mark, verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, Jesus and the guys, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he wouldn't let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, wait, "Wait, yeah, (laughs) what? This is love? Wait a second, this is the very thing you're here for, isn't it? I mean, you The crowds are gathering. The need is at the door. Yeah, you've made a name for yourself. Now's your moment. Yeah. And here's all the need. Yeah. Here's all the, you know, the compassion of God. Yes. Jesus' ability to say, you know, uh, it's time that we go. He is not ruled by need. Get this. He's not even ruled by opportunity. So just let that sink in. Mic drop, yes. (laughs) Mic drop. (laughs) Jesus is not ruled or compelled or constrained or bound by need, nor is he by opportunity, okay? Because it's all right here at the door, and we get so tangled up in things. All right. So let's look at 1 Peter 5 now, verse 7. So Peter learned a way of life from Jesus, and when Jesus ascended— Peter and the guys began to write about it, right? So yes. the New Testament, so that we would be able to enter into that life ourselves. First Peter five, verse seven, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. I'm gonna read it again. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Peterson translates it in the message, live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. Yes. What's that doing in your soul as, mm. I'm, as I'm reading that? Oh, it's just rising up. It's rising up. And, um, and I'm feeling the scriptural pushback. I'm hearing like, yeah, but what about bear one another's burdens? Mm. Mm-hmm. And even as you read that, I'm hearing and knowing, you no, know, we bear one another's burdens. We care, we love, we engage where God calls us to engage, mm-hmm. but we're not meant to be buried by them. Yes. This cast your cares upon yeah. Jesus. Yeah. We bear one another's burdens by bearing them to Christ. Ooh. 
right? We, we intercede, we yes. love, we pray, we help. We are not meant to be buried by one another's burdens. Hmm. So again, gang, like if you watch mature love in action, watch Jesus, whatever bear one another's burdens means, you would see it most beautifully expressed, most clearly expressed in Jesus's life. Yes. Right? Everyone's looking for you. Let's go somewhere else. <laughs> okay. Yes. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Bring it all to God. Don't be anxious. Don't let this weigh you down. And then the famous, famous, famous passage in Matthew 11, starting with verse 28, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and the burden I give you is light. It's one of my favorite verses ever. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you've got a little bit of a history. Yeah, that yeah. Verse. That was the verse that um, when I opened the scriptures in my place of desperation, and loss and um, didn't think I could go on with my life, opened that up, and that was the verse that I opened it to, and that's when I gave my life to Christ. 1970-something. Eight, something yeah, or like 1980, that. a while ago. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Let me teach you, because I'm gentle. And you will find rest for your souls. So it's just a good, it's just a good question to go, well, okay, so if we're not restful in our souls, then we're not experiencing Christianity as the gospels intended it. Right. 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 Yes. Because gang, what we have to realize is we are constantly being yoked. Other people would love to put their yoke on you. Mm -hmm. The world would love to put its yoke on you. And Jesus is saying, exchange all that for mine. Come and align with me, partner with me, union with me. I love Peterson's translation of it. He says, are you tired, worn out, burned out? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. See, there's that piece about watching yes, uh -huh. mature love, right? Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. How appealing is that? <laughs> I know, I know, and exasperating. This is one of those classic biblical passages that for years just, it just, frustrated me because I'm like, I'm not there. I'm not there. I don't know what this is. Right, the easy and light part. What is that? Mm. Right? Yeah. How do we get there has been my heart's cry for a long time. Right, right. Yeah. And I think this practice ultimately is about trust, trusting God, mm. trusting that he is actually able to intervene and to care and to move and to love in ways mm. that I long for, but I'm not able to do it. Mm -hmm. It's it's crushing me. It's heavy for me. And I do care, but I trust that mm -hmm. God is God. And therefore, we give it over. Yes. Because here in Matthew, in Philippians, in 1 Peter, and in the life of Christ— modeling mature love for us, what we see is the invitation is to an unburdened life. Maturity is not carrying the burdens of the world. And one of the things that really troubled me, all three of our sons went to Christian colleges at their own choice. We let them pick where they would go, and they went out of state. And, and as we began to experience the world of Christian college through them and through their experiences— I was really, really troubled by this, that weekly the colleges felt 
I think I can, with some compassion, understand what was constraining them. But here's what they would do. Weekly, they would have a chapel or a seminar or classes, and they would expose the student body to the heartbreak of the world. And so it's, it's human trafficking, and then it's the injustice toward a people group, and then it's the loss of indigenous cultures, and then it's the destruction of the earth itself. Yeah, and, and it know. wasn't just like, we'll do one a week. No. It was, they buried them. And I, I think this happens at, at every college, maybe in high school, where your joy is stolen and you're just told the world is an awful place. And here's the 45 things that are happening right now. Let exactly. Me, yeah. Exactly. And what I was watching happen, I think it was done out of an earnest desire to say, hey, we got to wake these kids up. You know, they've been raised in these for the most part, these little Christian homes, and they're in greenhouses. This is the perspective, mm -hmm. at least. And we really need to bring them into the reality of the hurting world because we're going to go out there as Christians and we're going to help this hurting world. But what the result was, the fruit was, was compassion fatigue. Mm. Yes. And this has really swept the church now because the to the justice movement and this idea of We've really got to awaken Christians to the heartache of the world. Again, that's a good motivation. That's a good thing. And yes, we're supposed to help and intervene. Absolutely. But I don't think we're realizing the effect of it without also teaching the graces of 1 Peter 5, 7, Matthew 11, the easy yoke, what mature love looks like. We're not balancing it. Mm -hmm. And so... Let me go back to the hour that we live in. Every human being now has an extraordinarily complicated life. The technology, the amount of media coming at us, the pace of life, everybody's having to deal with that. But in addition to that, the Christian is also laboring under the heartbreak of the world. And what do we do and how do we care? And so there is this compassion fatigue. And it used to be a phenomenon largely restricted to a couple of professions. This is very, very documented and well-known in the social services. Anyone who is a caregiver. A counselor. Uh, yeah, the, the number one issue in caregivers is compassion fatigue and burnout. World Health Organization just listed burnout as one of the global crises now. So it's a global crisis yes. of burnout. And we have to come back to what does mature love look like? We see it in the life of Jesus. We're invited to it in the scriptures. And part of it is learning benevolent detachment. That I love you. Uh, I will do what I can. But then I have to let this go. I can't carry this. Right. And then you see Jesus, all those people come. And he said he healed many. And I, I think the call is to ask Jesus, what's our part? Like, we are meant to do something. Yep. But we sure can't do everything. Right. Right. And you should know them by their fruits, gang. Here, exactly. Here's just another really easy test on both sides of this question. Well, you'll know them by their fruits. Uh, do you feel f uh, carefree? Do you, are, you, are you living freely and lightly? Does the yoke feel easy and the burden light? Um. Or are you fried, overwhelmed, frantic, running, hard-pressed, right? I mean, you should know them by their fruit. Yeah, and withdrawing because you're overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. The cynicism, the anger yes. that, you know, I'm checking out, but it's not done in love. Yeah. You'll know them by their fruit. And the fruit of not practicing benevolent detachment, I, I just, I'm embarrassed how easily I get pulled into the drama of things. So... A little while ago, we were invited to speak at the church of some friends, and I thought it went pretty well, personally, but no one contacted me afterwards. I didn't get that that Thank text you. Yeah. I was wow. waiting for. Yeah. Boy, that was super. Thanks so much. Everybody loved it. And so what did you do since okay. you did it? I watched myself, and I watched how, you know, you go from, gosh, I wish we would have heard from them, to, oh, no. Oh, no, the reason we're not hearing for them is it went terribly. I offended people. They're talking about us. We've undermined our relationship. <laughs> In fact, we probably sabotaged the whole message that we bring in that one moment. Honestly, Wait, I'm telling you. How fast did this happen? You know, 30 seconds. <laughs> 
I'm telling a true story, very recent that we get pulled into the drama. We get pulled into speculation. We get pulled into worry and, and all that. And I was not benevolently detached. And I came to Jesus and I, and I said, Jesus, how'd it go? And he said, that's not the issue. First, give it to me. Mm. Give this to me. Let yes. it go, John. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. <sighs> And as soon as he said that, I was aware of the reason I'm entangled in this is I'm looking for affirmation. I'm looking for validation. Hey, how come I didn't get that little attaboy? You know, how come that didn't come? Where's the, where's the gratitude? Where, oh, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I have brought my needs to this and now I'm entangled in it. And it took me two days of repeated benevolent detachment to really let it go. Because you know the enemy is going to jump all over this Absolutely. Too, right? Yeah. So what do you want to read from the book? What passage? Um, okay, let's go there. This is from the chapter on benevolent detachment. To make room for God to fill the vessel of our soul, we have to begin moving out some of the unnecessary clutter that continually accumulates there like the junk drawer in your kitchen. Everybody has a junk drawer. That black hole for car keys, pens, paper clips, gum, all the small flotsam and jetsam that accumulates over time. Our souls accumulate stuff too, pulling it in like a magnet. And so Augustine said, we must empty ourselves of all that fills us so that we may be filled with what we are empty of. Over time, I found no better practice to help clear out my cluttered soul than the practice of benevolent detachment, the ability to let it go, walk away, not so much physically, but emotionally, soulfully. Allow me to explain. We are aiming for release, turning into the hands of God whatever is burdening us and leaving it there. It's so easy to get caught up in the drama in unhealthy ways, and then we are unable to see clearly, set boundaries, respond freely. When this happens in relationships, psychologists call it enmeshment. Mature adults have learned how to create healthy distance between themselves and the thing they have become entangled with, thus the word detachment. It means getting untangled, stepping out of the quagmire. It means peeling apart the Velcro by which this person, relationship crisis, or global issue has attached itself to you or you to it. Detachment means getting some healthy distance. Social media overloads our empathy, so I use the word benevolent in referring to this necessary kind of detachment because we're not talking about cynicism or resignation. Benevolent means kindness. It means something done in love. Jesus invites us into a way of living where we are genuinely comfortable turning things over to him. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Now pay attention here. Jesus said there is a way to live freely and lightly. I know that you read that verse, but it's really bears mm -hmm. repeating. It's worth marinating our hearts in. It's worth meditating on and memorizing. Like, say what? Say what? I think one of the, the ways to look at the fruit of this is to say, am I becoming a more joyful person? Mm. Because a mature believer should actually be becoming more joyful. And it doesn't mean you don't care. It doesn't mean you don't have Tears of intercession at times. Or heartbreak or exactly. grief or loss. We're not pretending. Right. And the, the world doesn't stop. We're living in a fallen world. But we have to give it to Jesus mm. regularly. Mm. He, he is a happy God. Yes. So the, the only way, I think, to, to do this is to practice benevolent detachment and to give everything mm. and everyone to God. Mm. 
I'm really glad you chose this chapter for today because I actually think if you were to choose one practice Mm -hmm. of the many, many, many little treasures in the book, this would be the one. And it was interesting. I, I was doing a podcast the other day, and we were talking about burnout in pastoral ministry and how burnout among ministers is yes. so common, mm-hmm. tragically common. Right. Like, it's just a thing. It's like, oh, yeah, that happens. It's like caregivers, and it's like social workers and the helping professions that burnout is a well-known syndrome in the ministry. And you go, wait, 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 why? These are the people who are most hooked up to Jesus. Committed, the, yeah, wanting to serve. These are the people who have a life with God. Mm-hmm. The gospel seem to say that that won't happen if we learn the unforced rhythms of grace. So what's going on? Anyway, we were talking about pastoral fatigue and ministry burnout. And I was noticing in the conversation in this interview how the temptation is to say, you're right, you're absolutely right, I'm with you, I need a vacation. I need four weeks, I need to get away, I may need to quit. Like we start putting a really big time frame on the answer. Like, I won't get out of this unless I, uh-huh. yeah. you know, get six months off. Or you're right, I need to pull out of the ministry for a while or something, or I just, I need a holiday. And what I was trying to explain is if you make the solution something that's far out ahead of you and probably unattainable, most people can't get six months off, mm-hmm. you will crush yourself because then you just keep up with the madness. Like, you can't get to the you, solution. You lose your soul. Right, and I was trying to say that benevolent detachment is available today. Yes. It's available right now. It's available in the moment, and you will be amazed, friends, what this will do for you. So if all that's true and biblical, and you shall know them by their fruits, Hun, why is it that we, you and I, and most people have such a hard time with this? Why are people pushing back against this even now? What is it in us that makes it so difficult to practice benevolent detachment? Oh, I think there's so many different things. But the first thing actually that comes to my mind is that I forget God. I actually forget. And so I'm just in the midst of my day, and I might pray absolutely about things, but I don't let it go. I don't let them go. I I continue carrying them because I kind of think it's my job. Like, it's what I'm supposed to do. There you go. Say more about that. Why? Well, if it's my children, well, I'm their mother. And I've been given a special dispensation or something to carry them. Or as a believer, I have a responsibility. And the thing is, is it's not just coming internally, this message. No, no. This is really coming externally. And um, I'm on Facebook, and I can't get on it any day without getting at least four major heartbreaking crises or or things that need people to rise up and engage with. Yes. And I feel so guilty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to, and I care about these things. So again, I can pray in the moment, but Mm. I just feel weighted down and I'm not actually sure why. Maybe because I just don't even know how to to give it to God in such a way Mm. that He carries it without me feeling like, oh no, I'm doing it wrong. I'm not loving anymore. Bingo. Bingo. See, that was the compassion fatigue I was talking about. You get on Facebook and here's these heartbreaking stories and The human soul was never meant to carry all that. We live in far too large of a world. The human soul is kind of village-sized. You know, you were meant to carry. Yeah. You were meant to be involved in and simply even just be aware of a fairly small amount of news. Mm -hmm. But because of, you know, the global news industry and media and social media and that kind of thing, technology, smartphones, you just know about too much. But what I wanted to get to was, I think what you were describing is, isn't this love? Isn't this loving? I mean, as a mother, am I supposed to carry? Right. It feels like love, or it feels loving. Mm -hmm. And so I think to name one of the reasons for our listeners to consider is, I think we have some broken understandings of love. Right, because— That whole sentence, that phrase about a parent is as happy as their unhappiest child. Yes. 
versus my children can actually not be doing well and I'll be okay. Yes. I still get to be fine. Yes. My hope is built on nothing less, yes. right? And on Christ, the solid rock I stand. I really think there is another way of love. It's so fascinating. The book Boundaries has sold jillions, jillions, and continues to. And it's like a 20-year-old book. Mm -hmm. It continues to be a bestseller. And it just lets you know people are feeling burdened. Yes. And they're asking, please help me out of these enmeshed, entangled dramas. So they're looking for help. And that's a great thing, by the way. I applaud that. But I think it's because of confused understandings of love. So I just want to name that as one. I think I'd name another is fear for me. Mm. I think fear of what's going to happen in that person's life, in that conversation, fear of, oh, did I do something wrong at that church and that's why I'm not hearing from them? And how come they didn't answer my email immediately? I go to fear. Yes, Right? And yeah. so fear keeps me from letting it go and giving it to God. Mm. Mistaken love keeps me from letting it go and giving it to God. I think false guilt. Yes. Gang, let's get the enemy into this mix here. You know that there is nothing he would love to do more than overburden the compassion of caring people and take you out. Right? Right. And I think that's what he was doing at those Christian colleges, or still doing. I yes. Think, I think it is evil. You saw the effect. It's the war. You see the effect, and the effect is not engagement, or the effect is desperate engagement and then burnout. Mm -hmm. the, the average duration of a person in social justice ministry right now is less than two years. Yeah. Less than two years. That is not a good statistic. The burnout, the overload, the compassion mm -hmm. fatigue, and so— the enemy knows that this is a tool for good-hearted people, for empathetic people, compassionate people. So I think there's that. Yes. Right? Fear, false guilt. And, and then I want to add one more thing. You, you alluded to it early in the podcast. I think that our ability to practice benevolent detachment, lovingly letting it go, giving it over to God, our ability either to practice it or not practice it reveals what we think of God. Absolutely. It does. Is he trustworthy? Is he involved? Does he care? If I let it go, is it just going to fall through the cracks into the atmosphere? Well, that's what we think. Mm -hmm. If I don't come through, no one will. Right. Exactly. I was just with somebody recently who was told by someone they don't even know well, I want you to come through for my life. <laughs> Literally telling them, I, oh, I need you. I've chosen you, <laughs> and I need you to do this oh, for me. Gosh. And the person I was meeting with felt that, but if I don't do it, who's going to do it? And isn't that loving? Yeah. To the peril of their own soul. Yeah. To the neglect of the things that God has given them to do. Right. And it's not their job, by the way. It's Where not their is job. Jesus it's Jesus' job. In that other person's life. Exactly. Right? God cares more than I do. And he will raise up the help that they need. And the portion that's mine, I'm yes. happy to do. Yeah. But yeah. I give even that to yes. God. Yeah. Yeah. So, gang, we are describing and urging and trying to persuade you, give it a try. That's give it. it. Give it a try. Give it a try. You shall know them by their fruit. Benevolent detachment. I give everything and everyone to you, God. I give everything and everyone to you. And as you just settle down, just give this a moment in your day. We use the pause app to do this. Yes. The one-minute pause, three-minute five-minute pause. And the center of the pause is this practice of, I give everyone and everything to you so that I may receive more of God. Every human soul is in desperate need of more of God. If we're going to be resilient and withstand these really hard times, then we have to be filled with more of God. Well, you can't get there except through the door of benevolent detachment. 
Augustine's thing. You, you must first empty yourself of that which you are full yes. so that you may be filled yes. of that which we yeah. are currently <laughs> empty. Okay, so we're going to do it right now. And it's not just as simple as, okay, Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. That's a good beginning. But oftentimes, I don't know what I need to give over, so I will ask God, Yeah. what do I need to let go of? Jesus, what do I need to let go of? And again, this is in the, in the book and in the center of the app. We ask Jesus, what do I need to let go of? And you might be really surprised what he names. So here we go, gang. We're going to practice a little bit of benevolent detachment right now. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you alone are the fountain of life. You alone have shoulders big enough to carry the world. I can't carry the world. I can't. You alone are the savior of the human race. You alone are God. And you invite me to come to you weary, carrying burdens, and that you're going to teach me rest for my soul. And so, I come to you now, and I just begin with, I give everyone and everything to you, God. And I just kind of try and begin to get my soul there. I give everyone and everything to you. And the beautiful thing is, in this moment, you can do it for a moment. You can do it for 60 seconds. I give everyone and everything to you, God. Jesus, what do I need to let go of? What am I carrying right now that I'm not even aware of? Just listen, and as Jesus shows you things, then give them over. I give everyone and everything to you. Jesus, take every yoke off of me except yours. I have been yoked by so many other things. I throw them off for yours alone, your love, your goodness, your life, your affection for me. I give everyone and everything to you. And in the place of those things, I need more of you, God. I need so much more of you. Fill me with more of you. Fill me, God. Fill me. And as we're praying, my last prayer here for us today, friends, is this. Jesus, teach me mature love. I don't think I know what it looks like. Teach me mature loving. I am carrying way too much, worrying about way too much, fearful, angry about way too much. Teach me mature love. I want to love like you do, and you are able to walk away. Friends, I, I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's been alluring. You shall know them by their fruits. Stace, what's been the fruit of practicing benevolent detachment over the last year. Oh my goodness, literally coming up for air, coming up for air, a freedom of soul, an increased belief in the faithfulness of God, and a freedom to love more deeply because I'm not responsible. Yeah, that's beautiful. And the good news is the book is out this week, the week of February 11th. Woo -woo! Super stoked, very excited. I, I just think this has the power to heal a lot, a lot, a lot of souls. I really do. I'm so excited Me for too. you, mm -hmm. friends. If you haven't got your copy, get it. By the way, I'm going to do a book study conversational on Facebook Live in the month of March. So grab a copy now, get into it, and then we can have a, an experience together on Facebook I know you're just thinking of people right now like, oh my gosh, my pastor needs this. Oh my gosh, my mom needs this. Oh my gosh, you know, the burdened people of your life. What a loving thing to give it to them. Introduce them to the Pause app. It's called the One Minute Pause by Ransomed Heart. 
and you can find it for free in the App Store. We're getting such beautiful feedback and you just watch it heal their souls. And, and then by the way, then you don't have to heal <laughs> their souls. Okay, so thanks for listening. We'll do one more in this series next week and then we'll move on to some other things we have for you this spring. <laughs>